That was beautiful music. Yeah. You don't want it to end when it begins, you know. And uh, saints, I need your prayers. When the spirit catches me, yo, kosia. But today I'm here to speak and to testify and not to preach. So I had to remove my jacket just to remind myself that I'm not preaching. You know? uh, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm sharing from my heart. Uh, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this moment and for this time, this afternoon on your holy Sabbath. Hmm. That you have given us, Father, is a blessing so that we find restoration and we find strength in our troubled lives. Help us, Heavenly Father, to understand the value of this time so that we may use it faithfully like good stewards only to walk in the path, in the design and in the purpose that you have set for each one of us. Thank you, Father, for your spirit in this place as I open my mouth to testify now. Please be with me. Give me the perfection of speech in the spirit that in the simplicity of words, Heavenly Father, this word of hope and of trust and of faith in you, a God who gives second chances, may be effective and effectual. Forgive me of my sins for I'm unworthy Heavenly Father. I know it to stand in these holy grounds and speak your holy word. But thank you for your grace and for allowing me to be a co-laborer with you now. In the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. My name is uh, Tulisi Mukwamoy. Umukwa being the clan name because all of us carry history. We come from somewhere. And when we live our lives, we don't just live for ourselves. We have a name to carry. And we have a future generation to think about. So I pray that the testimony that I'm going to give will be one that will cause somebody to stop and think about life. And the choices that we have to make as we go through the journey of life. But more importantly, that somebody may be led to a position of saying, God, give me a second chance to live my life differently. Not just for me or my family, not just for posterity after I'm gone, but for the sake of your glory, God. I run a ministry called The Regenerated Life. 
It is a support ministry to the church. And I'm pursuing a vision that God gave me in 2008 while I was in a squatter camp in Mozambique. I have a message to share. It's a message of healing for people who have been broken in this life because of poor life choices, mistakes, and failures. And I have a God to talk about because I know him and I've seen him at work in my life. He is able to give second chances in life. I want to give a testimony in the time that I've been given about my Jesus and about my experience with him. By the way, I'm a pastor's kid. I'm a PK. Yeah, and I'm one of those who fits the stereotype. The PKs who lose their way at some point in time. And the few who find grace in God. And they come back to the path. And I'm blessed to carry on from where my father stopped when he retired. And talk about this Jesus Christ who hung on the cross. Luke chapter 15 verses 17 to 19. This is what my Bible says. And when he came to himself. Mm, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. Second chances in life. Man. And I will say unto him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I am no more worth to be called thy son. Make me like one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him because he's a God of second chances. Amen. Let me lay the foundation and move. The son is born to a good family. It's a rich family, a wealthy family, a stable family with everything that you can ever want. Because the Bible testifies the father had many servants. You can't have many servants unless you are stable financially. But he does not recognize the blessing of being where he is. And of being a member of the family that he belongs to. And he loses his head. Just like I lost my head at some point in time. Mzawa. And I forgot that I was born into a Levite family a family of the calling and a blessed family where everything was okay. And then I lost my way. So he loses his way. He goes to his father and he says, Father, give me an inheritance. How do you ask for an inheritance from someone who has not yet died? That's another story from another day. But he looks at himself and he sees himself as being adequate he seals himself. He looks at himself. He trusts in himself more than he trusts even in God who is in heaven. He becomes too wise for life. Some of us at some point in time become too wise for life. And we choose a path that will lead us to extreme pain, to regret and a darkness that we cannot handle simply because we have trusted too much in ourselves. So he gets his inheritance from his father and then he goes away. Papa, bye-bye, I'm gone. And he separates himself. There's a danger that happens when as a child you separate yourself from your parents. When you separate yourself from the values, from the principles, from the life, the wishes, the aspirations, the design and the purpose that the people who gave you this life as your parents wish for you. And when you think that you are too wise and you want to walk on your own, that separation can lead to a lot of pain. But most significantly, there is a danger in being separated from our God who is in heaven, our Father, our Creator, the cause of our existence, the one who gives us this life. The moment we allow the devil to tempt us and to lead us away, to disillusion us, and make us think that we can survive on our own away from God, we have started down a path of derailment and removal from the design and the purpose of God in our lives, just like this young man. And the Bible in the books of Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 12, 15, the, the foolish man thinks that he is wise in his own ways, in his own eyes. 
That's the young man, the prodigal son, looking at himself in his foolishness and seeing himself as being wise. And yet the real wisdom of God, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, comes from fearing God. So as we grow up as young people, because my ministry is particularly interested in the growth of young people, their establishment and development in this life. Remain founded, remain strong, rooted in the word of God, in the fear of God. Then you may have wisdom that will help you to make the right decisions in this life. The young man lives. He goes away to a faraway place. At the age of 13, I started making foolish decisions. 13 years old, it was 1995, and I was in Form 1. All along, I lived my life okay with my parents and with God. But at the age of 13, no, at 13, you are old enough to make good decisions or bad decisions in this life. But I allowed the foolishness of life to lead me in the wrong direction. And I moved away from the path that my parents had been teaching me and from the path that... My father, being a pastor, would teach us from the pulpit. The path that the elders of the church would teach us as young people growing up in the church, I moved away from that. I lived a life, I started to live a life that removed honor from my family name. That removed honor from me. That removed value and the weight, the dignity, <laughs> the, 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 the gravitas of life. Not just from myself, but from my family as well. And not only that, it was age of 13. There's something about these adolescent years sometimes. And if we're not careful with our children and we don't pray for them and fight for them, when they become adolescents, some of them easily lose their way. I not only lost my way before my parents, I also lost my way before God and I became separated from God. Now look, pastor's kid, you, before you go to sleep, you have... You have a crusade in the house every day before you go to sleep. And the priest of the house, who is your father, reads the word and he prays over you. And when you go to sleep alone, you are encouraged, please talk to God. This is a very spiritual home that I'm coming from. You wake up in the morning before you even brush your teeth. You're meeting in the lounge and you have to pray and read from the word of God. And even if you're just drinking a glass of water, sometimes you find yourself just praying and thanking God for the blessing of water. But I lost my way. I lost my way and I became separated from God. I lost my life of prayer as a child. I lost that habit of reading the Bible. And I lost that seriousness and dedication and loyalty to the church of God. Because we need those three things when we are growing up in life. We need prayer, which connects us to the throne of God and keeps us safe and allows the Holy Spirit to work in us. We need the Bible because it teaches us the will of God and teaches us life principles that correct us, that reprove us, and that instruct us in the way of righteousness, as Paul says in Timothy. And we need the church to have a place in our life. You know, I fear and tremble in these postmodern times when church no longer has a place to play, a role to play in the lives of our young people. And it's more of conquer, you know. And uh, the Shabins and the taverns where 16-year-olds and 14-year-olds die drunk and high on nyawope and on heroin and other things like that. And they no longer have a place for the church of God in their lives. You know, I passed through a phase in life where the church, yes, I was going through the motions of attending church on Sabbath. Hey, I'm a pastor's kid. I have to dress up and go. But I was no longer serious about church. I opened up a way for the devil to come into my life, and he hammered me very hard. I separated myself from the values that my parents had taught me, that the church had taught me. I lost that dependence on my parents, that submission to the authority of my parents, the obedience that every child needs. The secret to a successful life is not the highest possible kind of education or intelligence. It is obedience to God. That is what unlocks the blessing of God in our lives. I lost all of that, and I failed to remain loyal to God. There is no life without loyalty to God. And so I started to make poor choices, just like the sun in the book of Luke chapter 15, the Bible says he left and he went to a faraway country and he lived a prodigal life. That's a heavy word to use to describe the life of a person. 
when you hear someone saying this one is now living a prodigal life, it means that nothing in this life can remove them from the path of destruction that they have chosen. Because a prodigal life is a riotous life. I'm visiting in a country where uh, uprise, uh, where riots sometimes happen. People, you know, go into malls. They break things down. They burn them up. They get into the road, put tires, melt down the tar that is supposed to be for roads that help. That's a riot. That's what it does. There is nothing good that comes out of it. Even back where I come from, at a point in time we experienced this. We found people running to the supermarket that they needed to go and buy in tomorrow. And, and, and uh, rain second, it, ravaging it. And then only to wake up tomorrow and discover they need milk, but they've destroyed the very thing where they're supposed to be buying their milk. That is what a riotous life does, a prodigal life. It's a life that destroys you, removing you from the possibility of ever having a strong foundation for the future that God has designed for you. He lived a degenerate life, an unstrained life, a, a, a diabolic life, a destructive life, doing everything that you can imagine in this life that a human being can ever do to themselves. Who was a lawyer doing damage to himself? And I'm, I, 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 I identify with that, where I'm coming from, just a little bit. Because I also lived a delinquent life, a riotous life, a destructive life from the age of 13 in 1995 up to the time I was 27, year old, 27 years old in 2008. That's almost 15 years of being lost, and it's no small time. I started to have bad friends, yet the Bible advises us, blessed is the man who walks not with the ungodly or you know, sits in the council of the wrongdoers. I chose wrong friends. They influenced me in the wrong direction at a tender age. I started to waste time and squander the time that God gives us in this life, the opportunities of life that God gives us. Because God just doesn't give us our design and purpose for life. He doesn't give us a reason to live. God also gives us the time and the opportunity to build ourselves up in the plan that he has for us. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. And those plans, in order for them to come to be in life, Svanda, Gumele Sevens, he says, Iskati and the opportunities that give us. Well, I wasted those opportunities. I failed to number my days. Huh? I failed to give value to my days. And I started to waste time at school. Age of 18, I started banking class when others were in mathematics, learning about quadratic equations. I was in the bush watching birds sing, running away from the classroom with bad friends. When others were learning biology, I was busy hiding in the hostels under the beds or elsewhere around the school. And that continued in my life from the time I was in Form 1 up to the time, hey, I even got to university. And it was such a disastrous life to live. At the age of 14, when I was in Form 2, Mzawa, age of 14, when I was in Form 2, I started to drink alcohol. I can't say beer because beer is the 5% thing, you know. Yeah. It gets you drunk, but there's still hope that God may find you and the Holy Spirit may bring you in the right direction. I started with the Spirit right from the beginning. So we should be careful. Watch over our children. Look at where they are going. Look at the kind of friends that they have. Because even when they are young and you still think they are innocent, things can go wrong. My parents didn't have an idea that their son, a pastor's kid, was now drinking and smoking weed at the age of 14. I was learning at a public school in Gweru by that time, having moved already through three schools because my life was a disaster. Not expelled, but being transferred with the hope that perhaps somehow in my new school I was going to find my way. So I'm now in my third school already, Mambo High School in Gweru, in the ghetto, in the high density suburbs, and I'm taught how to drink and how to smoke. There is power in Christian education, my brothers and sisters. Sometimes we may not understand that, but we are safer with our children in Christian schools than in public schools. Because in public schools, there's no restraint. No one cares about what your child is doing. And that is where I learned how to drink and how to smoke. 10 o'clock in the morning, we're jumping over the Jura wall. We are going into the fields between Mambo High School and Ascot. And we are hiding in maize that has been planted by the old women there. And we are smoking weed. 
jump back into the school. We run a riot into the school. We don't sit for classes. We are in class only when the teachers are not there. When a teacher walks in, we are getting out. Lunchtime, we go to the gum trees, either near the basketball court or the football court, and we are sitting down and we are smoking more weed. When you knock off and we are going home, at the age of 14 and a pastor's kid for that matter, smoking more weed, crossing over, going to Nashville where we used to stay with my parents, smoking more weed. And the unfortunate thing is that even in our communities, these temptations are there as well. And soon enough, the devil was able to lead me to where weed was being, was being sold in the communities. And I would smoke it with friends in the community, believe it or not, even with people in the church. It's not everyone who is in the church who walks in the path of God. So we must be careful with our children. Just because your child has gone to a building that has windows and is called a church does not mean they are going to meet people that are okay. The church is a hospital and there are many people in the church who are sick. And your duty as a parent is to look out for the interests of your child in the church and out of the church. The kids in the church would be excited that we are smoking with the pastor's kids. It excited them beyond anything, you know. So they would offer me imbanje for free and I would not even have to buy it. It gave them a kick you know, I was smoking with a pastor's kid. At the age of 15, I transferred. I went to another school, Hunga Mission. And when I got to Hunga Mission, continued having bad friends, continued drinking and smoking and over and beyond that. 15 years old, I got into trouble with the police. Can't talk about that now. There is no time. I need the whole two weeks to minister to the brokenness of human beings. Got in trouble with the police. I damaged my life with that trouble. I hurt my parents in the most unbelievable way. But when you're young, you don't see that, you know. You're just living your life. It's all about you. My father is a pastor. He's supposed to be standing on the pulpit. Preaching the word of power to other people's children. But here he's, he's his child at a school that is run by the church in which he is a pastor and an administrator. And I'm doing crazy things. It made his work very difficult. And unfortunately, the devil takes our brokenness and he makes it so public. And it becomes bigger than anything that is good in our lives. So as far as Mtulisi Mukwamoy, Omtaka Paul was concerned, it was all disaster. And when my father would stand up on the pulpit, Baba of the disaster. So it was really, really, really terrible. Form four, I'm 16 years old. Naturally, I failed. Because you can't pass. You're not in class. Others are in class, you're walking 12 kilometers down the hill to go and get drunk at a bottle store. In the middle of the night, when others are sleeping and dreaming geography. You are being stung by beer in your head. You are walking back. You walk into the hostel. It's time to wake up. You have not slept. You have a hangover. You clean the hostels. You clean your toilets. It's a boarding school. You go for breakfast at 7. By 8 o'clock, you are in class. But no brain. The mind is intoxicated. That's why P P P Peter advises that we should be sober-minded. Because the moment we allow intoxicants to come into our mind, we open up a way for the devil to damage us in a bad way. I failed my form four. Lost time. Others went on to A level. I was at home. Facing the parents that I disappointed. It was a terrible time to look at their pain and to see myself having lost time because of the foolishness of my life like the prodigal son. By the grace of God, I went to A level. There was no event. There was still a good boy, you know, having felt the pain of failing in form four. So, nice guy. I even became a prefect at Anderson High School. And then I went to university. But when I got to university, Solution, I see some former Solution University students here who witnessed my destruction, the damage that I did to myself. Yes, I can. <laughs> In the early 2000s, before some of you were even born, I can see some kids here, you know, who have graduated, who are now working, and they were not yet born when we were playing with school, you know. Um, went to university, fell back into a life of Poor friends, went back to drinking hard, smoking weed hard, harder than before, walking from the university. It's a Christian institution where you sign a form that says, I do not drink, I do not smoke, I will not drink, I will not smoke. But now, it's at a mission station. 
jumping Ama Fence Solution Mission, walking to Deru de Nord, some six kilometers away from the university, to get drunk at a bottle store in the rural area, and then go back to school drunk. So you can imagine people are looking at me, the pastor's son, and no time for class, no time for assignments, no time for the library, no time for quizzes, you know, write final examinations, obviously, are going to fail. There is no seriousness in my life. I started off with a degree in environmental science, Bachelor of Science degree. Within one or two semesters, because of the confusion that was in my head, I moved to Bachelor of Science Environmental Health. Within one or two semesters, I changed. I changed faculties altogether. Went on to Bachelor of Arts, English, and Communication. And then I got tired of that. Within one or two semesters, I changed. I went on to Bachelor of Arts in uh, Peace and Conflict Studies. And then, hey, the demons were festering me and they were in control, they were in charge, you know, the demons of brokenness. And I moved from there. Next, I'm going back to environmental health. I get confused again. I go to, to, to Bachelor of Arts, English and Communication. Six years, no graduation. No accomplishment. I'm not down. Come on, you can hear me, I'm speaking now. It was the foolishness of failing to remaining obedient and loyal to God and to my parents that got me to that point. I remember when I was in grade six, you know, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I fancied myself, you know, walking in the corridors of John Hopkins Hospital, you know, wearing a gown and saying, God loves you and he's going to use me to heal you, you know. <laughs> But because I lost the way and I lost my relationship with God and with my parents, I lost all of that. Six years later, I still have not graduated. I dropped out of university. And what an embarrassment it was and a humiliation to my parents. From there, I left the country. I tried to run away from my problems. Then I thought I could go and have a life in Swaziland. But brokenness that is not healed will haunt you wherever you go. When I got there, God was merciful and he gave me a chance to start again at life, you know. Giving me an amazing opportunity to intern as a journalist without a journalism degree <laughs> and to use the gift of music that he had given me to have a life. Actually to get paid for paying the piano and then someone actually removes money from their pocket and they give you. And everything was going okay. But because there was no God in my life, I messed that up. I even got an opportunity to do missionary work while I was there. I messed that up. I found myself living in a very, very, very painful state of life, poor in a foreign country, having long lost contact with my, 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 my parents back in Zimbabwe. I found myself having to rent a room in Kukwin with a door so that it doesn't open at night. You know. There's no bathroom, there's no shower. You wait until it's dark and pray the clouds cover the moon. Then you stand by the corner of the wall and you bath from a nine liter bucket with just about four liters of water. I struggled and I suffered. No money to buy food, nothing. Ended up having to buy partially contaminated means meat from a supermarket near where I was staying in Swaziland. And I would go home and I would cook that and I would not wash the pot because I wanted to preserve the oil and the salt that I had used before so that I can cook the following day. There are times when I would eat half of the food that I've cooked and I leave some so that I can eat tomorrow. You wake up tomorrow morning, you look at the food and you say, God, give me the power to overcome this hunger that I am feeling. This food I'm eating in the evening, I can't eat it now. By the time you come back into that mkukwini room of yours, ants have already started feasting on the food. You just put everything on the fire. You say a prayer over the food with the ants. And you just eat everything. Lining up behind supermarkets to get loaves of bread that would be thrown away because something is wrong with them. And now I'm a pastor's kid, but I'm finding myself living like a vagabond in a faraway land. Things didn't work out for me. And instead of listening to God, because that was God speaking, God speaks through pain sometimes, you know. I was too stubborn and I thought, let me cross the border, Lomahashi, and let me get into Mozambique. Having not put my mind to it, that Mozambique is a Portuguese-speaking country. 
And I come from a former British colony. And the only international language I can speak is English. My Ndebele and my Shona and nothing else. I crossed the border into Mozambique illegally. And there's so much that happened in between another day and another time. Invite me to your church. I'm campaigning for myself now so that I can tell you the whole story. And I found myself living in Maputo. And I could not speak the language. I can't get a job. I can't do nothing at all. I'm all alone. I ended up finding myself in a squatter camp just outside of Maputo. Far away from home. Just like the prodigal son. Who after he had squandered everything that his father had given him. God gives us grace and we squander it. And when we squander it, we suffer the consequences of our actions. That's just the way of life. This boy found himself living with pigs, eating with pigs, sleeping with pigs. Now he has been reduced to an animal. The devil can reduce you to an animal if you're not careful. Remember Nebuchadnezzar started to compete with cows eating grass because he did not obey God. So now I find myself in a squatter camp. No life. The most terrible pain of life. Nowhere to go. All the value of life removed. Haunted by nightmares of regret of everything that I'd ever done in my life. My life is devoid. It has no respect. It has no dignity anymore. And I'm living at the mercy of God. Just like many of our young people. Who will become too wise for God and for their parents. In one way or another. Many of our young people are dropouts. They have no career. They have no financial stability. At the age of 30, still asking their fathers to buy socks for them. I went through that. Some have fallen pregnant as teenagers and their mothers to kids when they are kids because they failed to stay in the way of God. Some have become addicts to cocaine, to crystal meth, to nyawope. And they, are, they watch life being stolen from them every day and they're now powerless to do anything about it because they chose the wrong way in life. Some are incarcerated in prison. God has given me the privilege in this ministry of visiting young people in prison and ministering to their brokenness. And they are there because they made a choice to separate themselves from their parents and from God and their suffering. But even for the young men in the Bible, a time came when the Bible says he came back to himself. Because when there is a separation, we leave ourselves. We don't just leave the way of our parents or reject the way of God. We reject ourselves. It's as if it's a person that has been removed from himself. Your life is lost. But there's a point in time when you must come back to yourself. And allow God to speak to you and to give you the second chance that you need in life. The young man remembered, I have a father and he's a rich guy. He's got servants who are even living a better life than me. I'm living with pigs. And believe it or not, there's a moment in my life when I was in a squatter camp in Mozambique. When God started to reach out to me. Ngoba Unkulunkulu does not give up on us doesn't. There's a song that says he was there all the time waiting patiently in line and my God had been waiting for me all this time and through the pain of being a squatter in a foreign land God ministered to me and I found my way back to God and back to a life that is value not because of a crusade but because of the pulpit of pain Allow God to speak through the brokenness of your life yes, and let him lead you to greener pastures yes, and to still waters. Amen. Came back to my mind. Yes, sir. And I said, to yeah, man. you can't believe in a life like this. What is this? No. It's 2008. All of your life has been wasted. 15 years of your life. And you have nothing to show of it. Tulisi, you are a child of God, man. Yes, sir. Created, made in the image of God and after his likeness. Yes, and you are not fit to be a squatter. Yes, 
Because God gave you everything to become the best that you possibly yes, can sir. be. And you left the way of God. But God started to whisper to me. And I heard the voice of God in the midst of a squatter camp. Yes, and God said, come back home to yes, Lissiman. Come back home. Yes, Amen. I made my decision. I don't know what kind of brokenness you are going through. Because brokenness is no color, I'm one. Brokenness wears a jacket. That's what my wife said to me last week. Brokenness can wear a suit. If brokenness yet go, be black or pale and come to church in high heels, man. Brokenness goes into the office. It has a degree. It has a career. Brokenness can be poverty. Brokenness can be money. Brokenness comes in different faces. I don't know. But there's a God who is in heaven. A God of second chances. Yes, it was in 2008 when I received my vision for this ministry. In the middle of a squatter camp, surrounded by the darkness of my brokenness, God having reached to me. Do you know, some of us are theoretical about God. Yeah. We are too academic about God, too abstract. We talk of a God that we cannot witness to. I know the voice of God. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes. Amen. <laughs> I said, Mutulisi, this is Pretoria. Don't cry. But when I think of where I'm coming from, yeah. and I think of the grace to be alive and to be standing on this pulpit when people that I messed up my life with some ended up in maximum prison on death row in Zimbabwe and some died in foreign lands having achieved nothing but my God of second chances The John 3.16 God, for God so loved the world. Yeah. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, including Tulisi, umtaka Paul, umtaka Musa, umtaka Mukwa. In the worst state of my life, when I called upon his name, he heard me. Yes. Because we serve a God who hears. Yes, a God who regenerates <laughs> the devil breaks us yes, but God is able to pick up <laughs> the broken pieces of our lives <laughs> like the porter and he can put us back together again oh, yeah. oh! Yes. Yes. don't know why you're at church but I'm here because I know him and he restores the devil dethrones. He put me in a squatter camp. But God promoted me. He elevated me. He rebuilt me. And he repositioned me. And now, I enjoy the grace of being an apostle of brokenness. Oh. The prodigal son, Wakumbulekai. Let me not tell you about that because you already know it. You can read it in the Bible. But you can't read my story in Norway. I'm in a squatter camp in Mozambique. And I say I need to go back home. I need to go back to my starting line of life. I now believe I can have a second chance. Not only that, I'm still broken, but God is telling me I am going to use your brokenness to minister. So I found confidence in the voice of God, not in me. When I look at myself, I am nothing. I've squandered all the opportunities of life. And I don't have it within me to believe that anything good can come out of me. But Jesus Christ opens my eyes and I'm able to see beyond my brokenness at that very moment, dirty, torn clothes, but I see the apostle of brokenness in me because God has given me that vision. So I've closed my guava paper, you know. Next time when I come, God will have given me an iPad or whatever tablet. <laughs> like Max Moyo and... Uh, but like David, sometimes you got to use the stones that God gives you. 
as he builds you up to the place where he wants you to be. I went to the church headquarters. Church, I don't even remember when was the last time I had been at church. By the way, I've never been censured or disfellowshipped or removed from church membership because you can be broken in the church. People don't see what's going on in your life. So no church body is going to sit on your case, you know. And I had not been to church in such a long time, you know. And then uh, I decided, let me go to the headquarters of the church in Maputo, to the union. And I asked around, where's the union? I was shown where the union was. <laughs> then when I got there, I discovered that the president of the union had been a student at Solus University at the time when I was foolishly drinking, smoking, doing politics, running out of class. And the CFO of the union had been a former lecturer of mine at Solusi University. Hey, it's hard to face people who know about your past. And most departmental directors, so they just look at me and I'm there, I'm saying, I need help, I want to go back to Zimbabwe. Ah, this one. <laughs> But by the grace of God, three of them eventually put their own money together. Then they went with me <laughs> to the bus terminus. They could not trust me with the money. Lest I use it, I abuse it, and I come back to be a problem to them again. So they wanted to get rid of this Zimbabwean problem. Let's go and put it in a bus. Then they bought a ticket. They didn't give me the ticket in my hands lest I was going to sell it. They only gave it to the conductor when I was sitting in the bus and the bus was moving away. The bus, the ticket only took me as far as Chimoy. I had no money in my pocket. But nothing can stop you from going back to your second chance when you've made up your mind. I walked from Chimoy to Forbes Border Post. And when I got there, I've got to skip some things. By the grace of God, I crossed over into Zimbabwe. I had no money, not even a cent on me. Just did a search, oh, I'm dirty, my hair is overgrown, I'm greased up, you know. My clothes are dirty, and I'm wearing these funny rubber shoes that are torn. And I said, I can't stay in Mutare, otherwise, I'm going to be a street kid in Mutare. I got onto the tarred road. I passed through Christmas Pass. I saw Nyanga turn off, I passed it. And I thought I'm going to stop, someone is going to have mercy on me and I'll get a lift to Arar. Usatan Aguchi easy in this life. Can't make things easy for you. In the end, I walked from, uh, from Tare. At some point I jumped onto the train, tried to play hide and seek with the conductor and the security. But they caught me before the distance had gone chucked me out of the train. So realistically, I walked from Tare to Arare. When I got to Arare, I found my cousin, one of my cousins there. Didn't ask no questions, just like God doesn't ask. Didn't judge me. Just said, there is a bedroom. Here are clothes, food is there. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. I finally got a job as a garden boy at Acadia SDA Church. And then eventually, I made my way back home. And thank God, my father is like the father of the prodigal son. He took me back in. I don't know how many years it is later now. But I can testify to the power of a God who gives second chances. And I stand here today. I've been given the grace to pastor at least two districts in Zimbabwe. To be a director of evangelism for an international support ministry. And now I'm an apostle of brokenness in the ministry that God gave me. So, I don't know what brokenness you're going through. But there's a God who is in heaven.
and he's a God of second chances. Come back, come back, come back. Not so, not so fast. Otherwise, you'll walk to Mutari again. I have spent the last two weeks with Mtulisi recording a full series of 13 episodes, 14, 14 episodes. of his life story. So it will be coming live on Melvi very soon. We've sat down and talked about his journey. Even after two weeks, I sat there and I'm weeping and I'm crying. Yep. And I'm like, what kind of a God do we save? I think the least I'm going to do is to pray for you. So I'm going to invite his cousin. This one knows the whole story. That's why he was laughing sitting there. Bob Mangena, please come. Brother Kabani, if there's any pastor in the house, Pastor Blose, um, this is nothing but a miracle. If there are any elders amongst us, please come forward. We want to just pray for this apostle I've never heard that in my life. Maybe apostle to the broken. Let's surround this man and uh, Pastor Blosser, you've got a mic. I want you to pray for him and uh, dedicate the ministry of regenerated life. Um, he has a vision he has not told you about, which he told me. And as Melvi Broadcasting Network, we thought we would launch him to the world as a divine voice out of Africa. So if those are watching across the world, wherever you are, he is your apostle for the broken. I'm not a commissioned minister, but you can do this. <laughs> but as an elder, I can say, here is a servant of the Lord who needs to teach others how, what it means. If it was in sports, we say you bought the t-shirt, you wore it, it's torn now. You need a new one. Let's lay our hands on him as we pray. Pastor, please lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you once again this afternoon to thank you, dear God, for yet more proof, yet more evidence that you are a God who still saves, a God who still seeks, searches, looks, and hunts for us, oh dear God, when we lose our way. We thank you, dear God, that you are a father who never gives up. Unlike the Father in Luke chapter 15, you're not a God who waits for us at the gates, but you're a God who traverses the very paths we took when we walked away from you. You're a God who takes the narrow and dangerous and treacherous ways, oh dear Father, yes, even unto the squatter camps of Mozambique, looking for us, oh dear God. Mm. We thank you, oh dear God, that you're not a God who only waits for us to come back to you, but you're a God who finds us when we are unable to find our way back to you. Hmm. And so, dear God, at this time, we want to thank you for the life of him to lead you, dear Lord. We want to thank you for finding him. We want to thank you for leading him to this place. We want to thank you for the call, Lord, dear God, that you have placed upon his life. We want to thank you for the purpose that you yes. have given him. We yes. want to thank you for the ministry, oh dear God, that you have blessed him with. Mm. And most importantly, oh dear God, we want to thank you for him, mm. oh dear God, for appointing him as a minister of the broken, a minister and apostle of brokenness, oh dear God, for many of us are broken, oh dear Father. It may not manifest and show itself in quite the same way. It may not show as rebellion. It might not show, oh dear Father, as giving ourselves to alcohol and substance abuse, oh dear Father, but it shows. It shows in the abusive words we share with our spouses. Our brokenness shows. It shows in the intolerance we display in our churches. Our brokenness shows. It shows in the abuse we met out against others on social media. It shows, dear Father, our brokenness shows. Our brokenness yes. shows in untimely, inappropriate comments about people's weight and inability to have children. It shows, dear Father, our brokenness shows. It shows in our racism. It shows in our xenophobia. It shows in our tribalism. Our brokenness shows. And so, dear Father, when we fail to see it, may you never turn your eye away from it. May you reach out and heal us. We see you too right now that it can be done. Won't you do it for us? Won't you find us? Won't you heal us? Won't you put us back together again? And then I pray for someone, oh dear God, who might not be in this auditorium, but might be watching from home. And they're looking at this story as impossible for them. They're hearing and listening to this testimony as something that is far-fetched because of how far gone they believe their lives to be. And so today, oh dear God, I want to say this in my mother tongue. Yes. 
abathi uma ngabe sebe izlahlile bona ungaba lahli wena abathi uma ngabe sebe digibalile wena uNkulunkulu wengcwele kube yila ufaka amandla ukubafuna khona Jesus Christ I pray O dear God that you may place in their parts ministers who will see the best in them when they begin to believe the worst about themselves I pray, O oh dear God, that you may position along our way and along the way of the lost and the broken and those who are defeated and despaired and despondent, O oh dear God, you may place in their paths ministers who will help them to carry their crosses, Amen. who will help them, dear Father, to find safe spaces. And two had a cousin yes. who gave him an abode and accommodation until he found his feet again. Yes. We may not have cousins, yes. but we know you have placed ministers, O oh dear God, in our path who will do the same for us. Won't you do it for us, oh dear God? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the life of this young man. Indeed, when we look and listen to what he went through, we understand how you attend to prayers that are offered. I want to ask just one thing that what Mtulisi went through mm. should end with him. Yeah. Amen. Do not let this extend to his children. Mm. Thank you. I know he will not be able to stand the sight of it. Yeah. I pray my heavenly father that your Holy Spirit who governs, who controls, who teaches, who heals. As he has experienced the healing, let him be thoroughly healed so that the offspring from now is that of healing, is a healed offspring. I know when he was moving around, he was carrying children with him. But I want to ask in a very special way, change the DNA completely and place your DNA in his life. Change him completely into your likeness. Thank you for the prayers that have been offered, that are going to be offered. Thank you for the powerful uh, testimony that we listen to today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.